Carol. Thank you for being here today. Welcome to Unleashing Light. I am so excited to have you here today to talk about Ayurveda and your process and your journey through this experience for you and excited for you to share your wisdom with other people. So if you just want to say a little bit about yourself, um, that would be great. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me too, Liz. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share and I'm sure through our conversation here in the next moments, we'll learn that that's really part of why I do what I do now. Great. So a little bit about myself. My name is Carol Nace, and I am an Ayurvedic practitioner. I'm certified nationally, and I really offer a variety of services through the lens of Ayurveda, whether that be lifestyle coaching, offering recipes, doing a lot of body work in the past. I actually had my own clinic for quite a few years where I offered body work, um, Ayurvedic detoxifications, but ultimately it all comes back to wanting to share the wisdom of what Ayurveda is and what it can do for each of us. Great. So if you could just explain Ayurveda um, to the people who don't know what that is, I think some people think of, oh, nutrition, some people think of body treatments, really just kind of giving us a broad explanation of everything involved and how it might um, be helpful for others. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's so many aspects to Ayurveda. It is called the science of life. And when you think about life, there's just so many components and facets to it. So it's really hard to even just say as simple as, oh, it's just knowledge and science of how we should live our life. But that includes our diet, our lifestyle, our interaction with nature, our interaction with our own personal self. And, you know, the way I describe it, and we can even get into what that means from, you know, my company name is Bodhi Ayurveda. And Bodhi means enlightenment. Mm. And that's what I'm hoping to do is help people find that enlightened wellness that's within. Um, because to me, what Ayurveda means, it's this enlightened state of a conscious connection with all of creation. Mm, beautiful. And it's about us living our lives to its fullest expression of our health and our happiness. This is our true self. And this is where we can come together and marry with even nature's intelligence, with our own intelligence. The way I see the way the lifestyle, the, um, the self-care, even managing our, the way we sleep and interact with, act, interact with everything around us. It's helping us connect to our soul and helps us become able to get past the limits of our own mind. I mean, we can talk a whole session probably about how the mind <laughs> controls so many of our own actions and even our own belief systems within ourselves, but it gives us a chance to get beyond those limits of the mind and even the confines of our body. You know, our bodies change they evolve, we have accidents, or we may even have illnesses that can find us from possibly feeling at our best. But Ayurveda can come back and really help us see past that, or even maybe not past it, but inward. The past is more of an inward journey of seeing our true self. And how do we do that through all these practices, not just diet, lifestyle, sleep, and self-care, but even practices of yoga, meditation, pranayam, all of these sister-related aspects of it. It's, it's a broad subject. <laughs> yes. And pranayama meaning breath, right? Yes. Um, and so when people hear like, okay, the limitations of the mind and Ayurveda, it's the science of life. When they hear that and they're going, well, really, what is like body treatments and nutrition and connecting with nature? How is that really going to help the limitations of our mind? What do you, how do you explain that to them? Mm. Excellent, excellent question. The way I've seen it happen for myself and my own story and also with a lot of the clients that I have worked with is that when we get to the point where we can find practices that one can manage, whether that is practicing breath work and breath awareness through pranayam or a meditation practice or even the foods that we eat and how that affects the way the gut mind connection works we can calm our mind down much more easily. We can find ways to concentrate on the things that we need to in life. And that can be a lot of just, that concentration can be that inward journey of figuring out what do we need? Mm, what yeah. does my body or my mind, my spirit need now? What is my purpose? It's that journey inward. Yeah, because for women especially, 
right? Women are always asking what other people need and we're not really yes. connecting to ourselves and, our body. and not to exclude men or anything else, but, um, but I know <laughs> women are just givers and givers and nurturers. And sometimes we really do come last in our own minds. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a great point to point out that us as women, I think that in the last probably five, 10 years, I've really started focusing more on women who are coming to that point in their life where the kids are starting to be grown up and taking care of themselves. The career is established. I have the resources to take care of myself, but I haven't done it in how long or maybe ever. And it's this loss of where to get started. Okay. So, so what, with Ayurveda, yeah, we can use, yeah, we can use these skills within Ayurveda of just learning how to just pay attention to ourselves and start trusting ourselves and learning just what am I going to put on my plate today? How am I going to prepare myself for a good night's rest? Yeah. How am I going to put that self-care as a priority um, on so many levels in a way that's in a very nurturing and rejuvenative way? So tell me a little bit about how you even heard of Ayurveda and what got you started as you were obviously a woman, I'm sure with lots of different things going on in your life and what you know, brought you into this path and what were you doing prior to? Yes, absolutely. So I'm a, I'm a mid-career. This is my second act, you might say, mm -hmm. uh, being an Ayurvedic practitioner professional. Uh, before that, I like to tease that I'm a recovering CPA. So mm -hmm. I had gone to school and got my degree in accounting, took the CPA exam, ended up working in auditing, which requires a lot of long hours and tax season craziness and travel and all of those things. And you know, I thought it was on the path that I really wanted in life start working up corporate ladders, getting all this experience, traveling the world. And, you know, that was great in my early 20s. You start getting into my 30s and all of that. And the level of work, the always giving outward towards my career really started wearing on me. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure my lifestyle habits were cr crazily in contributing to at the time. But, you know, I was living what I call the standard American dream. Sure. I was working hard had the house in the suburb, had the husband, had the dog, had the, you know, all these great things that we all strive for. But I ended up finding myself by my mid thirties, absolutely miserable and really, really unwell. Yeah. So something had to change. Yeah. Uh, family history was pointing me that I could follow that path and I could end up being in and out of doctor's offices, um, in and out of pharmacies, in and out of all sorts of health crisis issues. And I just didn't want that to be the only solution that I possibly had. So I had had the opportunity through my first yoga class, uh, the opportunity to hear about Ayurveda. They do have a lot of overlap. Some people even call them sister sciences. Um, so I'd heard that word Ayurveda in a class and it seemed really to resonate with me, but I didn't need it at the time. So I kind of tucked it away. And then all of a sudden when everything came to a crisis in my health, with blinding anxiety, digestive issues that were, had been going on for years, but were really starting to escalate. I was having perimenopause um, diagnosis by 35. And when I started having to have uh, lymph nodes on my breast being um, ultrasound for potential biopsy, that's when I was like, enough. Okay. That was something has to change. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That'll do it. So do that's it. when I pulled back that knowledge of that story or that, that conversation around Ayurveda and that yoga class and started hunting down a practitioner. Now, this was 15 plus years ago. There weren't a lot of practitioners around. There wasn't even a lot of internet searching going back then. It's hard to even believe, but even back then, it was hard to find somebody. But thankfully, my hometown of Milwaukee, we did have someone who had studied, was practicing out of her home. And I went and sat with her, spilled my guts on everything that was going on in my life. And she gave me the tools of Ayurveda to take back the reins, you might say, of my own life. So take me back into being in that doctor's office, thinking about all these lymph nodes and you know the doctor saying whatever she was saying to you. What was what came into your mind or was it fear or what that said, okay, like take me a little bit more into that because I think sometimes we get a lot of like 
small crises and then we yeah. kind of dust them away or sweep them under the rug and then we get nailed with a big one and it's like <laughs> okay so what can you talk a little bit more about that yeah I, and I think that's a great analogy where you know like life and nature can give us whispers mm -hmm. of what's going on and it's even probably our own inner intelligence, our own soul and, and, and inner voice mm -hmm. kind of going, you paying attention yet? Yep. And we're like, oh, right? let me get the toast out of the toaster and another knock. Right. And it's like, oh, someone's right. at the door. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, just like we see when nature gets out of, out of balance, then all of a sudden the storm picks up and it's almost like getting hit up alongside the head and saying, now are you paying attention? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it was really the scare of, is this getting to the point where I may have had a cancer or um, something beyond even just what, you know, a couple of pills could take care of easily. Sure. And I think that's what the, was the biggest thing. And I think it was just this, this sadness and this crying that came over me for quite a while of just how did I lose so much control over my own life and my own journey. And I mean, I come from a pretty privileged space in the first place, but yet when you don't have control of your own health and well-being and your happiness, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your means are. Yeah. And I saw, you know, like I said, I saw my mom was probably the biggest influence of that was the hereditary path that the way I was living was very similar to hers. And that was, I was expressing that future very fast. And I saw where hers was 25 years ahead of me. Didn't want to go down that same path. So it was time yeah. to take a detour. <laughs> yeah. A lot of medical diagnoses with her. Yes. And then was that generational before her too, as well? Or do you remember? Yes, it can be. Yeah, definitely. Um, when I think, you know, my grandmother died when I was very, very young, so we don't know, but she did have ovarian cancer. Uh, my mom had her first heart attack before she was even 50. So there was a lot of that to be kind yeah. of laid out. It was almost like a picture book of you want to see your future. <laughs> it yeah. felt like. Yeah. Okay. So you're like, all right, I got the message. I need to make these changes. And then what did you do to first start off? And what were the things that tested you? Were, were there points where you just wanted to give up because it got hard? Because I imagine it was like a 180 that you had to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I went from you know, barbecuing every summer to going completely vegetarian within 30 days and changing a lot about just taking herbs instead of medications, practicing. I think the fact that I really focused on food first, and this is actually even how I've approached a lot of my own practice with people. It's like, if we can get diet right, and it's something that we can hopefully all control as much as possible, it's amazing how fast you start feeling better, you know? So within that first 30 days of starting to live an Ayurvedic diet that was more aligned with what my digestive needs were, mm -hmm. lost 10 pounds, anxiety dropped in least by, I would say half of what it was before. And I would seriously say I was like blinded by how much anxiety and panic attacks and OCD behaviors I was having cut way in half. Wow. Um, and then slowly over time, then the, uh, the hormonal imbalances correct themselves. But that's, you know, that's not a critical path of tissue that we need to make. So it takes longer for that to develop and, and correct. But yeah, the important things, the diet and all of that really helped a lot. Um, it gave me my, my power back in a sense. I felt like I had control again over my life. Mm -hmm. um, that even this one meal at a time, I could control how well I felt. Mm -hmm. So it started very um, tactical in regard to like my diet and then my sleeping getting better and how I took care of myself improved. And it was, I wouldn't say addictive, but when you feel that different from feeling that much of in a crisis, it's, it was motivating by itself. I would say that's the best way of saying it, it was very motivating by itself. The small wins like that can be great for future progress. Yeah. And so what were the very first steps that you took? So I know you went vegan, but or was it vegan or vegetarian? Vegetarian. Mm -hmm. Okay. Vegetarian. So what were the things, obviously we know what you were taking out probably, but what were the things that you were putting in as like mm -hmm. the key things that kept you focused? 
Absolutely. I think, um, you know, one thing with Ayurvedic, and I think this is even a nice segue into just a little education on what Ayurveda offers around like diet. It's not just, a, you know, a diet in its own right. It's unique to each of us. So depending on how strong your digestion is, what's in season, what imbalances you may be feeling or conditions you have, we choose different foods mm -hmm. um, for each meal. And there's also other premises that follow that I wasn't. I was eating a lot of um, acidic type of foods instead of more alkalining foods. I was eating heavier meals at the wrong time of day. I was eating when I was upset, I was eating on the go. So there's these, this relationship with food. And I was actually just reading something this morning from Swami Satyadinanda about how food is like God, it is a gift from God. And if we're not respecting that and not seeing it as a offering to ourselves, it's, it's gonna work differently in how it, we digest it, how we rebuild our tissues with it, how it affects even our mind, that whole microbiome and the gut mind connection, all of these um, can be affected. So it wasn't just changing what I ate, yeah. but how I ate, when I ate, where I ate, why all of the, you know, the whole, the W is around it. Yeah. Can you just for people who maybe don't know, like what are the differences between alkaline foods and acidic foods and like the sure. times of days that maybe are better to eat? You know, if somebody is eating their dinner at like 8 30 PM and then they're just going to bed, like some of those practices or behaviors that we see that we sure. know aren't really healthy, how that those things can really make a difference for people. Yes. And I will preface what I say here with understanding that life gets in the way. And I always use this phrase that I'll talk about the, the ideal way of, of doing it, mm -hmm. but we have to get real of how we can fit that into our lives. Sure. You know, we're, you know, we're working, we're traveling, we have other commitments, but how do we try to find that, that happy medium between what's the ideal and what's, what's real for us. Um, so ideally, Mm -hmm. uh, an Ayurvedic day around meals would be, we want to start with a, a light, simple breakfast. Um, I usually start mine with stewing some apples or having uh, a light grain that is spiced either with sweet flavors, but not sugar. There's a difference between sweet tastes and sweetness. Um, and then I will just have that as like a, a moderate meal. Lunch is my biggest meal because okay. the power of the sun is there. So the power of our digestion is also highest. Gotcha. And then my meal at dinner is generally my smallest meal. Now that's what works for me. Mm -hmm. Other people might have to have larger meals at all three. Um, snacking may be okay for some people, but that's generally the rule where we say it's more of like a princess's breakfast, a queen's dinner, and a pauper's or a queen's lunch, and then a pauper's dinner. So that way, when we are sleeping at night, our body isn't trying to digest what's in our stomach because that's not where its energy is going. Right. It's trying to remedy and process the day, the breaking down of tissues, the micro digestion of what we've eaten throughout the day happens overnight. So when we eat really late, that can cause problems. Uh, what's on the plate? Um, it's really about tastes and the quality of the foods that we have. So you mentioned, yeah, alkaline and acidic foods. Alkalinings are going to be foods that are more in like the green categories um, or have a lot of watery content to them. So they don't create a, a spike in our pH balance as much. A higher pH is very acidic and a lower is more alkalining. So we want to be mindful because that acidity can cause like inflammations, um, goes against the free radicals and things like that. Um, so acidics, general rule, we stay away from the major nightshades. So our tomatoes, high acidic um, fruit juices, onions, even garlic, you know, we limit what we take in because it's medicine. So for people being like, that's all that I eat, those ones that you just listed are what I eat, what would you substitute or um, suggest as better ones? Absolutely. Uh, re replace instead of repressing food is a big help, right? Mm -hmm. um, so onions, I always say there's the leek, which is a less acidic food. It has a less agitating effect on our digestion and can cook up just the same. 
So that's a replacement. Uh, for garlic, I just use it very sparingly instead of on everything. There's also a spice called hing, H-I-N-G, which is like a resin that gives the taste replacement. And also if you end up going vegetarian and eating a lot of beans, it helps with the, the airiness that is created by eating those beans. So there's another nice great way to put that. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> that can be a helpful, right? Yeah. Um, some of the other ones like tomatoes, um, tamarind and, cam and cranberries mixed together can taste a lot like a tomato or tomato sauce, okay. um, even ketchup. So that um, is a nice tip for that as well. And we do like, you know, avoid eggplant and such like that too, um, because of the caffeine component. That's actually the, and that caffeine nicotine is actually in eggplant. So that's right. something to just be mindful of. And if we have, um, for some people, they're sensitive to those nightshades. So tell it me creates like joint pain or inflammation flare ups and things of that nature. So tell me about the nicotine and eggplant. I've never heard of that before. Yeah, it's, it's a mild compound within it but you know if we're we can get addicted to food just as easily as we can anything else and we we know that um, nicotine can actually be more addictive than some of our illicit drugs so we can actually get addicted to certain foods because of their components as well so we don't need necessarily nicotine in our bodies so we just try to avoid it i mean i don't care for eggplant but i just never heard that before so that's interesting <laughs> so yeah all right. And when you work with your clients, do you work primarily with nutrition? Do you also do some of the body work? What do you like? What do you really find joyful about the work that you do? Oh, gosh. Do? Yeah. What do I find joyful? All of it. Right. Um, that's a beautiful thing. That's and even possibly even some of the hard part of when I was starting to make that transition from the corporate world into the wellness world was where do I put my focus? Do I make products and these beautiful herbal tea blends and self-care products and all of that? And I did dabble in that and it just didn't seem like, okay, people were calming to it. So I'm like, okay, my Dharma may still be Ayurveda, but it must not be in this. <laughs> then I started getting into the body work about 10 years ago. And that's when things really started changing. Um, I actually ended up in Wisconsin where I'm originally from in Milwaukee that area, I had my own clinic for well over seven years, offering body work and the Ayurveda coaching as well. Um, there's a very specific and very um, sacred practice of detoxification in Ayurveda that includes diet, coaching, consultation, body work, um, and self-care called Panchakarma. So now that I'm moved down to North Carolina, I still offer the coaching online and I can help guide people through the detoxes, whether they're more of a home practice or I still travel back to Wisconsin in the spring and then the fall to help administer Panchakarma for people. That's great. So for people that don't know the term that you're saying and yes. some of the other um, body work offerings, just to kind of give them a little menu of like what that is and how it might be different than like massage or Reiki or rolfing or something like that. Can you just help them understand? A yes, little bit that absolutely. Let me talk about probably the three most popular body work treatments that I would offer. Uh, the first one is called Abhyanga and it is a full body oil massage. And we're not talking just about using oil over a lotion. We're talking about using probably six to eight ounces of warmed herbalized oil based on the season, your balance needs, um, even just, you know, if any conditions or imbalances we're trying to correct, I will pick a variety. There's hundreds of varieties of oil blends that you can choose from or even make your own. We'll warm that up and then it is just drooled on the, the arms and the legs. And then I've it's had it. It's lovely. oh, you have. Oh, yeah. I know. I, I know. I get so like, oh, I lost it myself. <laughs> um, it's a very rhythmic move and it's almost like a, um, a cosmic dance, I would say, of a massage mm. um, for people who maybe have had like a lomi lomi massage from like a Hawaiian style. I wouldn't mm. be surprised if there isn't a lot of cultural exchange of, of um, sharing there, but it's similar with like the oil and the movement, and it's done in the flow of the energies of the body. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I call it a, yeah, a cosmic dance with yeah. the divine. Mm -hmm. awesome. Okay. 
Yes. Yeah, uh, so if you get a chance to even try those, yes, search, look it out, look it out. And I'm sure we can put um, like Avianga is a in the comments of this yeah. too. So people know how to, how to spell it to Google search it in their area. Yeah. The other thing uh, that was very popular was Shiro Dara. Shiro means head and Dara means strand or, or stream. So it's about a stream of this warm herbalized oil that drops right here on the third eye across the crown. It sounds like you've had this too, Liz. It's my favorite. It's my favorite oh. one. And as you're talking about them, I'm like kind of drifting back into like my treatments. They're just so lovely. Yeah. There's another way to get the mind back on track, right? Mm -hmm. um, is to really this third eye point, which is also right over the point where the pituitary and the hypothalamus are master glands rest. So it's great treatment of calming the mind, rebalancing the hormones. It's good for the hair, of course, because you have all this herbal hair oil running through your hair. Um, and there's these, these specific energy points called marma points. Uh, that reside along the hairline that also help calm the rest of the physiology of the body. So it's a bit of a, a cosmic trip in its own way too, because it really does draw you inward towards yourself and the state of relaxation that comes mm -hmm. is beyond even just sleep. It's this, this real oneness with yourself that, that can be created. It's just that stream of oil just drawing you inward. Yeah, I say, would say that I got a lot of those treatments. I actually had a brain injury and it was one of the things I did use to heal and really calm the brain and my whole system. And then of course, like, you know, my whole system was out of whack at that point because my pituitary gland was affected in that mm. injury. And so, and so the hormonal piece was all off. My hair was super dry. It was just, and then to just have that like in my hair for like, a couple of days and just, it was just such a lovely treatment. So, yes. Well, and we know that the body when it's in stress does not heal well, you know, the whole fight, flight, or freeze, the body's putting its energies to keep us feeling safe and not necessarily taking care of healing itself or protecting the vital organs. It's trying to get us out of the situation. So whether it's an injury or stress, mm -hmm. We, or we don't heal yeah. enough. Yeah, or both, right? Yeah. yeah. Healing is stressful in its own ways at times yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. So I'm glad you've had the experience of, of trying that. Um, but the last one I touched a little bit, just these marma points, marma therapy, when we're working on the energy points, it's, you know, has its alignment with energy of like acupuncture, acupressure, Reiki. Um, but the lineage of Ayurveda that I study and practice from and their marma therapy is a very gentle, subtle connection with the energy flow of the body. And it's, we have these channels of vibration that these marma points sit upon and they all connect back to our soul and our heart center. So when we work those energy points, we're also reconnecting the flow of energy from the universe within ourselves back to our soul and to our heart center so that that can blossom and just light us up through life. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing better than some Ayurveda, <laughs> Ayurvedic body treatments. They are luscious, I will say. Um, mm -hmm. So tell me where people can find you both in North Carolina or Wisconsin. Um, what's the best Absolutely. way to reach you? Yes, I'm always um, an open book when it comes to sharing on what is Ayurveda and if it can help you. So one thing we know we'll be offering is um, I always offer a free complimentary 30 minutes of my time. If you want to discover what is Ayurveda a little bit more in depth, how it can be applied to your own life and, you know, just even get to know me a little bit better. Sure. I've always found that, you know, I have to, we have to mesh as well as people when we're working together for the best success as well. It's not just about the knowledge. It's about the connection that we're all on. Um, so you can find me at bodhi dash ayurveda.com. And if you do a forward slash discovery, you can get a chance to get on my calendar to have that conversation. Uh, I do offer the coaching consultations online from my home here in, in the Asheville area. And if you are in the Wisconsin area, I will be in Madison offering one-off treatments such as Abhyanga, Shiradara, and Marma in the middle of May at a place called Kosha. And I'll also be guiding a few people through Panchakarma, the, the detoxification method. 
as well during that time. And then I return back in October in the fall. Okay. Yeah, we'll make sure that we put that in the comments yeah. for people because I know they're going to be like, Bodhi, are you Ayurveda? How do I spell that? And <laughs> so we'll make sure we put it in there so people can find it um, and get in contact with you and hopefully get their lives back in order if they're feeling out of whack or distressed or unhealthy. Um, any last tidbits or any other little bits of advice you'd like to offer mm. or? anything important about your story or where you didn't give up when you wanted to? Oh, goodness. Yeah, I will definitely say that one thing that I've learned about Ayurveda is that you don't have to be perfect to receive its benefits and life will happen. It has happened for me even since being on this path where I was in school even and um, was still working the corporate job. So trying to balance having one foot in that world and one foot in this new world of Ayurveda was very stressful in its own right. Mm -hmm. And trying to be strong and get through it all and all of that, I found myself on a disability leave. Wow. And actually it was, maybe I find there's a thank you and everything. There was the, that time while I was on disability that I actually formed the whole mission and vision of Bodhi Ayurveda. It's like, okay, I am being enlightened to where the own wellness and healing can happen within myself. And I have to use these practices to continue to discover what that is for me and discover myself. So that was a big lesson. Um, and the other part of it is that, yeah, when life does happen, you can just pick yourself up, brush yourself off and Ayurveda is there for you every moment to start again and it's all about love so it doesn't it doesn't judge awesome well thank you so much for being here carol i am oh, so Liz. appreciative for everything you shared and just being able to offer your gifts to people there's always someone that can relate and someone that can benefit so i am hoping they find their way to you and you can do your good work in the world wonderful i appreciate it thanks so much liz i love being able to share my story and uh, yes. i appreciate your space to do so Thank you so much. We'll be in touch soon. Thank you.